Prince Harry used World AIDS Day earlier this week to call for COVID vaccines to be shared across the world. The outspoken Duke of Sussex compared the COVID pandemic to the HIV-AIDS pandemic that ravaged the world, noting the political failure to tackle both pandemics. However, talk radio royal correspondent Rupert Bell suggested that the COVID lecture from Harry was an easy bandwagon to jump on. Earlier this year, at the Global Citizen Live event in New York City, Harry and Meghan urged vaccine manufacturers to share their technology to help get the world vaccinated. He said that, while Diana was at the forefront of AIDS activism, Harry was getting an easy headline, he always jumps on the socially right bandwagon. Mr. Bell explained, Harry is comparing the situation now to what happened with AIDS. He has accused people of not doing enough to help those countries during the AIDS pandemic 40 years ago, and he is comparing like with like. The royal correspondent continued, he has had a pop at the pharmaceutical industry before, claiming they are just interested in sorting out the richer countries because they are the countries who can pay for the vaccines. He has done this before, and yes, it's a very worthy intention, but it's an easy headline for Harry to get. His mother Diana was in the forefront of helping the AIDS situation. But Harry always jumps on the socially right bandwagon. In the letter, addressed to the WHO Director General, Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus, Harry wrote, Vaccinating the world is a test of our moral character and we are experiencing a spectacular failure when it comes to global vaccine equity. That means breaking pharma monopolies that prevent vaccines from getting to communities around the world in need. That means governments honoring their promises and delivering the doses that they committed. He continued, that means pursuing international pandemic agreements with strict timelines and holding each other accountable to them. That means treating all human lives as equal lives. Harry has followed his late mother's influence in the fight against AIDS and its public stigma, even taking HIV tests live on camera. On World AIDS Day this week, Harry spoke movingly about Princess Diana, saying she would be deeply grateful to the scientific community for their work in combating AIDS. Meghan Markle, 40, and Prince Harry, 37, release one Christmas episode on Spotify last year in a new contract reportedly worth 18 million, but the pair have not produced content since. The Duke and Duchess of Sussex are said to have been given a gentle nudge from Spotify to finish the content, The Sun reported. Royal expert Neil Sean has now claimed the royal couple will be releasing another episode this month. Speaking on his YouTube channel, Mr. Sean said, Harry and Meghan are gearing up for a festive treat. Apparently they are going to be giving their reflection on their year in a brand new podcast. We could tell them their year, couldn't we? Fell out with their family, alienated everybody, fanbase dropped dramatically. Is there much to really talk about? No doubt we will get some sort of lecture on working mums and things they've done. His comments come after Meghan's latest appearance on The Ellen Show where she spoke of the difficulties of having two children as she shared more intimate details about them. After sharing a picture of the two-year-old feeding chickens while wearing yellow wellies in their home in Montecito, California, Meghan said Archie loves to dance. The former actress' high-profile appearance comes eight months after the Sussexes' controversial sit-down with Oprah Winfrey which left the royal family in crisis. Meghan and Harry have until now remained private about Lily, who was born in June and was named Lilibet after the royal family's nickname for the Queen. They are yet to share a photo publicly of their daughter. The Duchess told chat show host Ellen DeGeneres that someone told H, Harry, and I that when you have one kid it's a hobby, and two children is parenting. Don't miss suddenly we realized, oh right, Everyone talks about what it's like for the second child but no one talks about the adjustment for the first child when the second one comes along. I think they have that moment of, oh, this is fun, oh, this is how it is now. She also said that Harry loves the weather and lifestyle in California. The Duchess said Archie loves to dance and added she would do the cooking on Thanksgiving. Meghan issued a triumphant statement on Thursday morning after the Court of Appeal ruled in her favor upholding the High Court judge's decision over her privacy case. 
However, the defendant in the case and publisher of the Mail Online and Mail on Sunday, Associated Newspapers, announced in a statement it is considering an appeal to the British Supreme Court. The statement read, We are very disappointed by the decision of the Court of Appeal. It is our strong view that judgment should be given only on the basis of evidence tested at trial, and not on a summary basis in a heavily contested case, before even disclosure of documents. No evidence has been tested in cross-examination, as it should be, especially when Mr. Knauf's evidence raises issues as to the Duchess's credibility. After People magazine published an attack on Mr. Markle, based on false briefings from the Duchess's friends wrongly describing the letter as a loving letter, it was important to show that the letter was no such thing. Both the letter and People magazine also seriously misrepresented the reasons for Mr. Markle's non-attendance at the royal wedding. The articles corrected these matters and raised other issues of public interest including the reasons for the breakdown in the relationship between the Duchess and her father. We are considering an appeal to the Supreme Court in the United Kingdom. This statement mentioned Jason Knauf, who was Meghan's communications secretary between 2018 and 2019. Mr. Knauf was heard in November by the Court of Appeal through a written witness statement in which he claimed Meghan had written the letter to her estranged father Thomas Markle Sr. in August 2018 with the understanding that it could be leaked. He said she had sent him an early draft of the letter and had written, Obviously everything I have drafted is with the understanding that it could be leaked so I have been meticulous in my word choice, but please do let me know if anything stands out for you as a liability. Among other claims made by Mr. Knauf in his statement, the former Royal Communications Secretary detailed by sharing a text exchange with the Duchess how Meghan chose to call her father daddy in her letter as she had only ever called him in this manner and in the unfortunate event that it leaked it would pull at the heartstrings. Moreover, Mr. Knauf said Meghan had deliberately ended each page partway through a sentence so that no page could be falsely presented as the end of the letter. In her statement to the Court of Appeal, Meghan stressed she did not think her father would leak her letter as it would have shown him in a bad light. Denying she thought it likely her letter would enter the public sphere, she said she merely recognized that this was a possibility. The Duchess also said, the proposition that saying that I recognized that it was possible that my father would leak the letter, albeit unlikely, is the same as saying that I thought it likely that he would do so is, I would suggest, absurd. The Duchess said the text exchange showed she went to considerable lengths to ensure that the letter only went to my father. The Associated Newspapers statement also mentioned a People article, referring to a story published by the US magazine in early 2019 in which five friends of Meghan anonymously defended the Duchess and spoke about her father. The Mail Online and Mail on Sunday later published, in February 2019, extracts from the Duchess' private and personal letter to Mr. Markle over five articles. A few months later, in October 2019, Prince Harry announced in a statement his wife the Duchess of Sussex had decided to sue Associated Newspaper, the publisher also of the Daily Mail. Meghan claimed the Associated Newspapers articles containing her letter misused her private information, infringed her copyright and breached the Data Protection Act. In February, High Court Judge Lord Justice Warby gave summary judgment, which meant the case did not go to full trial, and ruled in Meghan's favor. Lord Justice Warby said the publication of these extracts had been manifestly excessive and hence unlawful. Giving his ruling, the judge said the majority of the content published was about Meghan's behavior, her feelings of anguish about her father's behavior, as she saw it, and the resulting rift between them. He added, these are inherently private and personal matters. A three-day hearing took place at the Court of Appeal in November after Associated Newspapers challenged this ruling. However, on Thursday morning, judges Sir Geoffrey Vaux, Dame Victoria Sharp and Lord Justice Bean dismissed the publisher's appeal in a ruling. The letter, the judges said, was personal, private and not matters of legitimate public interest. Reading a summary of their decision, Sir Geoffrey said, it was hard to see what evidence could have been adduced at trial that would have altered the situation. 
The judge had been in as good a position as any trial judge to look at the article in People magazine, the letter and the mail on Sunday articles to decide if publication of the contents of the letter was appropriate to rebut the allegations against Mr. Markle. The judge had correctly decided that, whilst it might have been proportionate to publish a very small part of the letter for that purpose, it was not necessary to publish half the contents of the letter as ANL had done. During this hearing, the judges were told 585 out of the letters 1,250 words had been republished in the five articles in question. Megan issued a strongly worded statement in the wake of this ruling, saying, This is a victory not just for me, but for anyone who has ever felt scared to stand up for what's right. While this win is precedent-setting, what matters most is that we are now collectively brave enough to reshape a tabloid industry that conditions people to be cruel, and profits from the lies and pain that they create. From day one, I have treated this lawsuit as an important measure of right versus wrong. The defendant has treated it as a game with no rules. The longer they dragged it out, the more they could twist facts and manipulate the public, even during the appeal itself, making a straightforward case extraordinarily convoluted in order to generate more headlines, sell more newspapers a model that rewards chaos above truth. In the nearly three years since this began, I have been patient in the face of deception, intimidation and calculated attacks. Today, the courts ruled in my favor again. Cementing that the Mail on Sunday, owned by Lord Jonathan Rothermere, has broken the law. The courts have held the defendant to account, and my hope is that we all begin to do the same. Because as far removed as it may seem from your personal life, it's not. Tomorrow, it could be you. These harmful practices don't happen once in a blue moon they are a daily fail that divide us, and we all deserve better.